Let's talk about the awesome history of Lithuania. Hello, welcome to Dangerous Policy, a channel aimed at intelligent people wanting to discuss important issues facing life and society. My name is Crispin, and today I'm starting my series on what I think is the most understudied area of history, and that is the, the life and times and influence of the Lithuanian people, because that is something that has contributed significantly to all of European culture and is among, if not the most ancient that exists today as a continuous society. Uh, and to that end, uh, ancient Lithuanian is certainly the oldest language that's still spoken today in Europe, uh, predating Latin by thousands of years. And I want to talk about why Lithuanian culture has been continuous and survived so long. So in part one, I'm going to start from when it is permanently settled from uh, at least the sort of late Paleolithic, uh, early Bronze Age, right through to the, the start of the Middle Ages. That's the period that I'll be covering today. Um, the actual part one of this should be on the ethnography of the ancient vaults, and there are many theories around that. I want to have more interviews and discussions with paleogeneticists and so on to, to really explain those theories well. Um, so watch out for that at a future video. So, But what I'm talking about now is when there is a clear and distinct group of people who lived in modern day Lithuania in the ancient world. What made them so interesting and important and what protected them and made them continuous to the Middle Ages? Well, two things in particular, and they're still relevant today. First and most importantly is amber. Amber that washes up on the Baltic coast in Lithuania is easily the, the best quality, the most beautiful, the most elegant, and the most useful of all amber that exists. And amber doesn't exist um, in large quantities in many places. So uh, that immediately put them on the world map. The second thing uh, of geographic importance is the massive, dense forest that made up the Baltic region. That created a lot of protection, particularly from highly mobile steppe armies, right? So the waves of nomadic tribes that would come in from the, um, from the, um, the steppe regions, uh, it would protect them from Mongol incursions later in the Middle Ages, all these other areas where, you know, being a highly uh, effective horse archer is not particularly useful in a dense forest. So that created a natural barrier that protected these tribes to which they were well adapted. On the amber trade, amber from at least 1600 BC, so you know, 3,500 plus years ago, was found across the ancient world. You could find it in ancient Ugarit, you could find it in uh, Egypt, you could find it in ancient Greece. Uh, it was particularly popular in ancient Sparta. Menelaus's um, uh, palace was considered to contain a lot of Baltic amber, according to the Iliad, um, in Mycenae, in Crete, uh, and also uh, as far away as India. Uh, so the ancient um, uh, Baltic amber was incredibly widespread in widespread use in the pre-Roman world. The ancient Etruscans, in northern Italy uh, were very um, uh, involved in the Baltic amber trade, purchasing a significant amount from it. We find a lot of Etruscan artifacts both in Lithuania uh, and also amber in Etruscan. There is um, uh, many reasons why amber was so valuable. First and foremost, of course, was its physical beauty and use for jewelry and, and other luxury items. What made it useful was that relative to other precious metals and things like that, uh, it was much softer. So you could use it for more intricate carvings. You could create figurines, you could create cups, you could create little signet rings, all kinds of particularly um, uh, intricate designs that are much more difficult to do with harder materials, right? So, so jewelers found it particularly um, valuable. There's also the medicinal properties it was thought to possess. So um, uh, amber contains cystinic acid. So if you boil it um, or you, you kind of uh, melt it in some ways, uh, mix it in with other herbs, it was thought to be a sort of antibiotic, if you like. Uh, the, the effectiveness of that can be debated. I'm not, not a, um, a medical practitioner or a, or a um, 
uh, you know, one of paleo medical um, expertise, um, but certainly to those that used it, found it to be of beneficial health. And then also significant, and what made people test also whether the amber was genuine or not, because plenty of people trying to do knockoffs, even in the ancient world, is that if you rub amber, you create a static charge. And you have to imagine what magic that would have seen to the ancient world, where you could, you know, create um, a, a physical attraction of the hairs on your on your arm or uh, of grasslets. Um, uh, it was thought to be numinous and powerful and offer protective properties. So it was used in all kinds of magical talismans. Uh, even Roman gladiators would use um, amber talismans as protection. They would embed them in their weapons uh, and thinking that it would give them um, divine power. Uh, so the the amber had a mystical properties and uh, and also mystical origins, right? So the ancient Greeks believed that it was from the uh, chariot of the son of Clymene, who flew too close to Helios and was struck down by um, Zeus with a thunderbolt, and that the chariot spewed across the Baltic Sea and is now washing up on land. Uh, one of the interesting things about the Clymene myth, and I'll leave a link to it, is its similarity in some respects to the Lithuanian um, story of Egle, Queen of the Serpents. Because Clymene, in her grief for her son, uh, her, she and her daughters turn into trees. And of course, you'll know from a previous video that, that Egle turns her sons and her daughter into trees as well, as well as herself. Uh, the, there are myths um, from the, the Indians um, who, who had amber. They thought that it was the um, dried out um, product of a, of the lynx cat. Um, that is, you know, an interesting theory. And, and my favourite, of course, is the actual um, story from Lithuania itself, uh, where um, a, a young fisherman um, called Karstiti, uh, he goes and, and fishes, happens to be fishing near the Great Amber Palace, which housed uh, Gerati, the most beautiful of the goddesses, uh, and her father, Pernicus, um, king of the gods. And Gerati sends uh, some mermaids to Custitus to say, look, don't, uh, don't fish near here. You're, you're, you're in sacred territory near the gods. Uh, and for whatever reason, um, the, this young man, despite having mermaids pop to the surface telling him not to fish there, basically ignores them and continues to fish. I mean, I found that quite, quite a, a certain degree of focus. He must have been very hungry. And uh, anyway, Gerati, um, upon hearing that she's been rebuffed, in her perplexion comes to the surface to see who dares to, uh, to you know, willfully disobey a direct order from the gods. Anyway, she meets him and they fall in love. They both fall in love uh, and they have this romantic, uh, tragic story in which uh, uh, Pernicus, who is outraged that Gerati has fallen in love with a mortal, um, destroys the Amber Palace, ties Gerati to um, uh, the remains of the palace at the bottom of the sea, uh, to which she is still there, and her tears are creating swells in the Baltic Sea, um, mourning both her incarceration and her lost love. Um, Gustatis is killed, and the uh, remains of the Amber Palace is washing up on the shores this day. That is, uh, you know, part of now sort of um, uh, Lithuanian folklore uh, and, and I think a really great story. And yet uh, what, at least one individual um, got it right in the ancient world and it's a quite extraordinary. So, uh, and it was Aristotle who observed that it was the dried out remains of tree resin. Uh, and um, you know they didn't have a proper concept of fossilization, etc. At that stage, but but he got the the, the fundamentals right. That um, he, and he observed that in amber that you see, uh, often there are insects and other creatures stuck in it, indicating that it was once a liquid. And the most logical place this would happen would be on a tree trunk. Ergo, it is likely to be the product of trees. Now, he also made the point that if you burn it, um, it apparently has the smell of pine wood. I'm not obviously I've never burned amber, so I wouldn't know. But but really interesting series of deductions from from this um, classical Greek thinker. Uh, you know, no wonder uh, Alexander's education was so good. Anyway, so um, so profound insight, but yet these uh, mythologies have certainly remained. And of course, uh, as I said, one of the things to test for whether the amber is genuine was to rub it um, to, to get that static charge. 
So very important in the ancient world as a, a valuable and rare commodity and unique to one location with a lot of natural barriers. And so that protected the Baltic tribes that lived there. The other thing that protected um, uh, the Baltic tribes there was the fact that the Romans never reached them. Uh, they, there was the famous, infamous Battle of Teutonberg Forest in which um, Arminius betrayed the Romans and Varus marched three legions into annihilation. Uh, that prevented continued incursions of, uh, of Romans into Germania for uh, 100 years until sort of Marcus Aurelius. Um, and uh, and therefore, they never quite reached Roman influence in terms of the Aesti. They didn't have direct trade relations. They were through intermediate trade routes. They never had hostages or anything like that that you would expect of, of, of the sort of Germanic tribes. Um, the first accounts we have, written accounts, of the Baltic tribes from the Roman historian Tacitus. Um, and he is writing... Uh, uh, you know, telling the history, obviously, of, of um, uh, the, on his Germanic treaties. Um, and he says that the Aesti, the Aesti, which is the dominant tribe in modern-day Lithuania in the ancient world, um, A-E-S-T-I-I in the Latinized um, spelling, uh, Aesti uh, were very similar to the uh, Germanic Swabi. Uh, and uh, I'll leave a link to the Swaby in because uh, I had a lot of uh, experience with the Romans and Julius Caesar had a war with with um, the Swaby. Uh, so uh, I'll leave a link to that. It should be in terms of similar culture, um, image and description. Now we have to take Tacitus's account um, with certain limitations and that he never actually personally traveled to the East. So uh, these are all things that he had observed and, and been told, but not through his direct um, encounters with them necessarily. He did nevertheless say that despite the cultural similarities between the Swaby and the Aesti, the Aesti language was much more similar to that of ancient Britannia, the original pre-Angle Britons, uh, and uh, therefore um, he surmised that um, the those that lived in ancient Britannia actually came from Lithuania. So the ethnography of that, again, we'll look into it in another video to see to what extent that is credible. Um, but uh, but certainly from Tacitus's point of view, the similarities in language were striking. And to that end, the ancient word for amber in ancient um, uh, Lithuanian was glacem. This is something that Tacitus records verbatim, glacem. And that was adopted in the Gothic word for glass, and then in the modern English word glass. So we see that direct influence from ancient Lithuanians to the modern English uh, that we use verbatim every day. The uh, ancient Lithuanians um, uh, would, would remain independent at least, and they were temporarily under the influence of the Ostrogoths um, in the latter part of the Roman Empire, about uh, sort of 380, 400 uh, AD um, for a period of time. But by 500 AD, we know they had won their independence because why we know that there was a letter from Theodoric the Great, Ostrogoth king, to the Aesti tribes thanking them for the amber uh, trade that they had established with them, right? So uh, there is clearly diplomatic communication going on between the Aesti and, uh, and the Goths, um, and the Aesti would remain independent both as a collection of tribes within modern Lithuania and as a, um, a, a collective confederation uh, well into the Middle Ages. So uh, amber, the Baltic forests, the preservation of pagan gods that were um, very similar to those that we would see familiar with the um, the Nordic gods of Thor and Loki, uh, when you know Pernicus and, and others, Divas. Um, we'll have another discussion about Lithuanian uh, pagan gods in the future, but that was preserved well past that when all of the others had converted to Christianity. Uh, and uh, and therefore they've been custodians of that northern uh, Baltic tradition for many centuries, well beyond the Roman Empire, well beyond the Gothic period and into the Middle Ages. So I'll leave it at that point. 
happy to answer any questions on this subject. Um, I find it endlessly fascinating. When I when I retire, I'll, I'll get to write my full compendium of the of the Lithuanian peoples because I think it's a really important text that hasn't been written properly. Um, and, uh, and certainly enjoy your comments, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.